duty, honor, country. That famous speech given in 1962 by General Douglas MacArthur at the United States Military Academy at West Point inspired many, including one young man who would go on to be one of the most accomplished generals in the 20th century, including serving as Supreme Allied Commander Europe. However, it is not what is happening overseas that concerns him as much as what is happening in the United States. Our politics and our broader dialogue as a society has General Wesley Clark very concerned. In this iteration of the Swift Hour, we talk about a wide array of issues from the state of our institutions to the future of our country and all the reasons why we simply need to start from the bottom up. You don't often think about a former general who is now so focused on bridging a political divide and bringing people together in this country. So obviously there's an issue, there's a problem. Well, I saw this firsthand, this terrible war in, in Bosnia when I was in uniform. And we actually uh, you know, managed to stop the war and hold elections there. And so we really paid a lot of attention to it. When I came back to this country uh, over 20 years ago, I saw this growing partisan divide. I had voted for Republicans, I'd voted for Democrats. My wife worked for a Republican senator as a, as a uh, you know, uh, assistant in her office. And, uh, and so I knew both sides of the aisle. And yes, there are differences in the parties, but uh, they're not differences we should be fighting over. We should be working together to do the best thing for the country. And um, instead, I found this increasingly polarized atmosphere and it's gotten worse. So we thought we should try to bring ordinary community leaders together, people who are not necessarily in politics but are affected by the polarization, and uh, communicate and teach them how to communicate, teach them about the political system, and let them influence their communities. I mean, the basic idea is that um, the democracy is no better than the citizenry that support it. If you have people who understand the issues, who can separate emotion from reason, fact from fiction, then you have people who can make good decisions when they vote. And in general, if you get the balance right between private welfare and the public good, then, uh, then you can uh, have a pretty good system, regardless of who's at the top, regardless of the structure, whether it's parliamentary or presidential. So uh, we're trying to um, help build democracy uh, in this country, the same way we rebuilt the American army after the Vietnam War. We went to the bottom of the army. Armies win or lose based on their soldiers. You can always get brilliant generals, but if the soldiers can't shoot straight, you're not gonna win. And um, you can certainly see this today on the battlefield in Ukraine. Same is true in a democracy. You can have brilliant, articulate, well-educated leaders, but if the people don't understand the issues, the structures don't know what they're voting for, if they're polarized, we're not gonna win this war of democracy against autocracy. But talk about the responsibilities between political figures and media. Because I've, I, I feel that there's so much focus on, well, if our politicians behave differently or did differently, but it, it, it's not easy for people to be particularly well informed when a media in certain instances is, might not necessarily be providing with unbiased information. So what is the responsibility to media and what is responsibility to our political figures? Well, I think, you know, uh, journalism schools always teach that you have to present both sides of the question. And in this country, we did have a fairness doctrine until the late 1980s, and we, we got rid of that, and this opened up the way for talk radio and a lot of things. It made a lot of people a lot of money, um, and it generated a lot of political friction. But um, the truth is that it all depends on the citizens and the voters. Um, it's, it's like my wife said, we came out of Europe and a woman said to my wife, Rush Limbaugh, don't you think he's a lot of fun? Isn't he fun? And my wife said, uh, is that a joke? Because she was listening to the substance of what Rush was saying, not getting the emotion. You know, politics is mostly emotion, yet democracy requires the use of reason. And this is the tension that, that's present in all democratic systems. 
It's one of the reasons that Xi Jinping says democracy can't be trusted, that autocracy will win, because he doesn't believe you can believe in ordinary people to make the right decision. We've always felt in this country that somehow when people voted, uh, the, the common will would, would surface. Um, but uh, it really starts with voter education. The media today, they do what voters want. If you watch a hot show with lots of emotion, they know it, and you're going to get more of that. If you turn that off because you want to understand really what is behind the problem of the Colorado River, then you're going to get more of that because it's all reflexive. So the media is just reflecting what the public wants. The question is, what does the public want? And that's a matter of the education. That's why we're working in our Renew America together with a cohort of about 30 people in each program. They spend six months. They do um, one virtual day a month with us. They learn to work, work across the aisle. They meet people they would never have met in ordinary life. And they find out they got a lot of things in common. It's a life-changing experience. And then we measure their impact for the next year. And what we're going to do is we're going to franchise this. So we started by proving the model, just like McDonald's began with one burger shop in Los Angeles or whatever. And then we want to take this across the nation to private colleges, to business organizations, and get Americans to talk to each other across the partisan divide. That's what will give us a strong democracy. And it will bring the media in line. Now, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk to you a little bit about um, some current events of, of today. Uh, Europe, the continent of Europe, is, is in the middle of a war, first time since World War II. Um, first off, talk a little bit about NATO. They're dealing with, they, the previous administration had one approach to NATO, this administration here in the U.S. had a completely different approach to NATO. Are you seeing NATO rise to the moment at this time? Yeah, well, you know, um, I mean, NATO is the oldest alliance, I think, in human history. It's over 70 years old, and it's always been in a crisis. Every three or four years, someone says, oh, NATO is going to be destroyed, you know, and it's been that way. I've been with NATO since in the late 1970s, uh, and again, as NATO commander in the late 1990s, and I still close to these issues today. And what I'll tell you is that um, the pledge of NATO that an attack on one is an attack on all is sufficiently binding legally to cast a blanket over most conflicts. Now, in the case of former Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia wasn't in NATO, and NATO had to make a really tough decision to stop that war in the 1990s. In the case of Ukraine, NATO made the decision, no, it wouldn't engage, but it would allow individual nations to provide assistance. So Ukraine is basically a fighting a battle for Western principles and on behalf of NATO, even though NATO is not engaged. Because as he announced his objectives, Russian President Vladimir Putin said he was going to go for more than Ukraine. It was about the Baltics. It was about restoring the situation back to the Cold War division. And uh, these nations, they don't want that. They want a Western way. They want democracy. So um, NATO is there as a sort of ultimate security guarantor. And yes, we wobbled under our previous president. I'm convinced Mr. Trump, if he'd been reelected, would have taken the United States out of NATO. That's clearly wanted, what he wanted to do. But the Republican Party has been pretty staunchly um, patriotic and in favor of NATO for 70 years. So he couldn't quite do it. Trump was adept. He knew what he could get away with. He knew how to cause friction. He knew how to tilt it that way. He knew who he was working for. He even praised Vladimir Putin on the eve of the invasion of Ukraine as a smart negotiator. Look, um, democracy is, it, it, it's, it's no stronger than the citizenry that support it. We've got to pull the people in this country together. The United States is like a mighty oak tree. One Donald Trump is not going to destroy it. But if the roots aren't solid, the tree can't prosper. And those roots are what individual people think about, how they think about their country, whether they vote, 
what they vote on, what their interests are, how they understand things. So um, that's what we're doing in Renew America Together is we're working on the foundations. How do people uh, follow along what Renew Together does? Well, come on our website, uh, renewamericatogether.org, and, um, and participate with us. And look, um, we're going to expand this program. So uh, for, if, you're, if you're interested in it, please contact us. We want uh, to, you can't build an army with just one platoon, but um, you've got to do a lot of things simultaneously. We think this is a concept whose time is here. We think Americans want to engage with each other. They don't want to argue across the Thanksgiving table. They want to be one family. And um, the things that you know unite this country, they're much stronger than the partisan divisions. But we've got to understand and pull our country together. It's really important. We can, um, we can show China that democracy is really the right way to go. There's no reason to use force. There's no need to have a war with China. We just have to agree as Americans to keep our own country together. And China will welcome the opportunity to work with us cooperatively. Well, General Clark, thank you very, very much thank for you. joining. And thank you for being at the 2022 Concordia Annual Summit. Thank you very much.